And one of the things that we're now building out is a chaplaincy track. And, um, and, and it has begun. Dr. Harry Simmons is leading us in that work. And uh, we're grateful to God for that. And so I'm just honored. My, one of my classmates is, is um, James Palmer. Um, has has really gone up in the ranks of chaplaincy in the military and I'm so super proud of my classmate and such a great supporter and so he's here so we will we will give them space at some point today to just uh, to just share their thoughts uh, some of our presenters and preachers are here and that means a lot when people come in early to be ministered to I got a real issue when you show up to do your part and then leave like you're the only reason you came um, I think every now and then you need to stick yourself in the way. <laughs> That's why sometimes I come in early just to sit because I need to hear and uh, we're grateful. So I'm excited to see Dr. Sampson here, Dr. Williams, um, and others who will be preaching and presenting throughout the week. Believe this, I actually pray about who does this. I I'm not looking to pay people off. Okay, let's try that again. This is where I sound more like a pastor than a dean. I'm not looking to pay people off because your soul is too important for me to, 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 to compensate relationships. And so whoever presents in Ellison Jones as long as I'm dean, and I know this has been the truth of the past, will always be persons that we genuinely believe, I genuinely believe, is the spirit of God. Again, the commitment is STVU connected, Virginia Union connected, because I believe we have to celebrate our own. And so today I'm honored that this wonderful woman who really God allowed me to connect to um, in this stage of my life. I would have never have known Dr. Angela Sims if I had become Dean. Uh, she made sense to me in a conversation we had. And it was, it was helpful because sometimes the wisdom you receive is because of the season you're positioned in. God doesn't have to say certain things to you because you're not in that season. But when your seasons change, and my season change, and thus the voices around me change. And so I could speak to all of her successes and all of her influence in terms of being a woman and theologian. But more important to me, she is the president of Colgate Rochester, um, and she is a leading voice in theological education, one of the few women of color who lead PWIs. And she's an amazing woman. Amen. And so she's coming now. And so if you will, would you put your hands together and receive Dr. Angela Sims as she comes to present today. My sister. I think I just saw my little sister Ayo Martin, so Ayo, it is good to see you, baby girl. I bring you greetings from an institution that is the alma mater of Howard Thurman, Martin Luther King Jr., H. Beecher Hicks Sr., Wyatt T. Walker, Phyllis Shepard, James Forbes, Samuel DeWitt Proctor, Bishop Joseph Clemens Sr., Bishop John Bryant, Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, James Creek, and the James Cheek, and the list goes on. I want to acknowledge President Hakeem Lucas, my friend and prayer partner, Dean John E. Gums, Reverend Dr. John Kenny, who souls into so many. And so thank you, sir, for the ways in which you continue to be a blessing in my life as I do this work to which God has called me, to the faculty, staff, and students of this beloved institution. Webster's defines alumna as a graduate or former student. I'm in that latter category. I am a former student, but not a graduate of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union. I was sent this way not knowing that it was simply a preparation to take me to the next phase of my educational journey. I entered the Doctor of Ministry program here 
And my advisor, the Reverend Dr. Allison P. Geis Johnson, who is a mentor of Katie Geneva Cannon and a mentor and daughter of Dr. Patricia Gouldchamp, told me that I would not have an, a choice in my electives, that I would take PhD seminars at Union Presbyterian Seminary, and the rest is history, because my cohort on the direction of Dr. Mary Young released me to go and do the other work to which God was calling me. By additional way of introduction, this, this talk, Black Women, Lives That Matter in the Academy and Church, it's important to understand that I grew up in a Northeast Louisiana hamlet and really didn't realize I was a country girl until I went back to do field work in 2010 and understood that I was deeply connected to the soil in ways that I had not imagined, even though I had all of these urban sensibilities. And so I grew up in this Northeast Louisiana hamlet and still recall several girlhood incidents where womanish behavior could result in various forms of punishment. And so today I give thanks for one of my mentors who is also one of my pastors, the Reverend Dr. Melva Sampson, who is a professor of homiletics at Wake Forest University and the way in which she is intentional about raising womanist girls. Familiarity, this notion of womanish behavior which could result in forms of punishment, caused me to recognize that familiarity with the cause and effect of an established practice, that children were to be seen and not heard, necessitated that I learn how to use quiet to my advantage. With a book in hand, I sat on the periphery and discreetly positioned myself to listen to conversations to which I was not invited. While some may say that I was nosy, I prefer to consider my actions an expression of inquisitiveness. I realize in retrospect that my childhood behavior continues to inform how I navigate the various communities in which I participate, the academy, the church, and so many other social and faith-based community organizations. In many ways, I am on a continuous journey of discovery in which I travel back in time while simultaneously weaving in and out of present moments that are somehow intricately connected to a time that is yet to be experienced. What is, coming, what is perhaps a coming to terms with a cultural way of being requires that I be purposeful to exercise courage to reclaim the womanish girl child who in a different place and time looked for creative ways to know more and in greater depth than was considered good for me. In preparation, almost two decades ago, for my comprehensive examinations, I elected to spend mornings with Alice. From Alice Walker's essays, I discovered new insights. Her words were and are in many ways, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Walker's willingness to go where many will not go, to put into print stories that have almost been forgotten, to delve into those places of pain and sorrow, to retrieve and to pass on lessons of strength and hope can only be described as a gift from the divine. From these almost daily moments, several questions emerge from her essays that highlight the value of deliberate recall in womanist ethical discourse. For example, Walker acts that we consider the way we learn to read. This, in turn, requires that we examine what motivates us so that we can accurately determine our commitment to become intentionally engaged learners. Ultimately, Walker challenges me to, rec to comprehend why reading counter perspectives is imperative and not optional. My journey with Walker is perhaps best described as one of immense gratitude, though not without tense-filled moments. As guide, sage, and ancestral linkage, Walker possesses diverse ways of knowing and embracing, while at the same time remaining a free spirit. Her prolific writing illustrates a connectedness that transcends the methodology commonly reflected in scholarly publications often publications that are written to a very, very narrow audience of maybe 
10 to 30 readers. While her work is sometimes perceived as an adventure into issues in which she is not recognized as a subject matter expert, and here I, what really comes to mind is the way in which if it were not for Walker, some of us would not have known about the horrors of female mutal, mutal, genta, mutal gen, genitalate, gen, the destruction of the few female organ reproductive system, right? <laughs> it could be, so it could be that Walker simply possesses the courage to go into those spaces that others have labeled as inappropriate or taboo. Walker's ability to find truths where everyone else seems afraid to look is a trait typically shared among individuals who deliberately probe beneath the surface in order to better understand the dynamics of power operative in any situation. For it is only when we, as Walker asserts in Living by the Word, and I quote, hold up a light in order to see anything outside ourselves more clearly that we illuminate ourselves, close quote. In one sense, Mornings with Alice functioned as a time of renewed reflection that enabled me to begin to recall my stories, as well as to garner strength to investigate places that I had neglected, distorted, discarded, or hidden. On the other hand, these encounters challenged my understanding of that which I define and describe as gospel. Most important, a lesson a truth that unfolded during my mornings with Alice was the discovery of voice that required me to begin to follow the questions that I had silently and consciously ignored. Walker's invitation to return to sources that contribute to our sense of self is so much more than a stroll through a, through a kaleidoscopic flower garden where she asked, is often difficult and pain-filled work. There are no readily apparent answers or solutions in her reflections. Rather, I frequently find myself confronting complexities associated with marginal constructions of existence. To address this dilemma, Walker insists that we dissect and analyze, as she suggests or even encourages us to immerse our hands into the metaphorical soil that is life to weed thoroughly, to water adequately, and to harvest gently in the diverse gardens that are planted to nourish us. This year's Ellison Jones Convocation theme, Preaching Matters, Embracing the Voices of the Past, Influencing the Future, is an invitation to acknowledge that in every generation, a remnant of scholars emerge who challenge status perspectives. Their critiques of normative constructs serve as models for subsequent scholars who learn how to work not only to eat, but also to work in a manner that enables others to eat. Yeah. Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon was indeed such a person. She loved life. She loved people. She loved laughter. She loved food. She loved good food. She loved imagining the not yet. She loved calling things into existence. And Carla Jones Esquire, you know the work that she's still yet calling to you to do from the ancestral realm. The progenitor of womanist theological ethics, Dr. Cannon was a scholar scholar, a mentor extraordinaire, who possessed an ability to discern what was most needed and generous, almost to a fault, very much like our beloved Dr. John Kenney in the sharing of her time and resources. A graduate of Barbara Scotia College, the Interdenominational Theological Center and Union Theological Seminary in New York City, Cannon laid the foundation for womanist religious ethics in her 1985 essay, The Emergence of Black feminist consciousness, and her 1988 book, Black Womanist Ethics. Almost 40 years since Cannon introduced a concept that, and I quote, examines the expressive products of oral culture that deal with the perennial question for liberation, as well as written literature that invites blacks to recognize the distinction between nature in its inevitability 
and culture in its changeability, close quote. Many black women in theological disciplines and areas of study have gravitated to the use of Alice Walker's term womanist as both a challenge to and a confessional statement for our own work. As noted in Emily Towns' essay, ethics as an art of doing the work our souls must have. As Cannon wrote, and I quote, the chief function of womanism is to use Walker's four-part definition as a critical methodological framework for challenging inherited traditions, little t, for their collusion with androcentric patriarchy, as well as a catalyst in overcoming oppressive situation through revolutionary acts of rebellion." Close quote. Womanist, as defined in Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, womanist prose, contains elements of tradition, community, self, and a critique of white feminist thought and provides a fertile ground for religious reflection and practical application. According to Cannon, and I quote, womanism requires that we stress the urgency of black women's movement from death to life. In order to do this, we recount in a logical manner historical consequences of what precedes us. We investigate contestable issues according to official records. In other words, Womanist religious scholars insist that individuals look back at race, sex, and class constructions before it is too late and put forth critical analysis in such a way that errors of the past will not be repeated." Close quote. And, and let me do a parenthetical pause a moment and remind us as, that as we watch as public school systems across the U.S. and increasingly state-owned institutions of higher education seek to re-describe the history of this country, Cannon's words remain prescient for us. This is the work that M. Sean Copeland suggests is non-negotiable as we consider the implications of black religious discourse and representations of black womanhood. As life-affirming moral agents, Cannon was adamant that, and I quote, we have a responsibility to study the ideological hegemony of the past so that we do not remain doomed to recurring cyclical patterns of hermeneutical distortions in the present, close quote. Today, when I remember the Reverend Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, who entered into Life Eternal, August 8, 2018. When I speak her name, I do so ever mindful to heed her instruction, and I quote, that a womanist methodology must critically analyze social, cultural conditions and contexts in order to burst asunder the dominant understandings of theodicy and produce new archetypes that release the Afro-Christian mind and spirit from the manacles of patriarchy so that black women might emerge and discern just what kind of moral agents we really want to be." Close quote. At the same time, I realize that I must name ways in which I accept, and maybe you don't do this, but I accept imposed standards of good. This process of self-reflection and introspection frees me to do the work that my soul must have. At the same time, I recognize that this self-identification process is a shared experience with my ancestors, that cloud of witnesses who affirm that it is good to dig deep, to reclaim, and to reinterpret traditions. Since the interpretive enterprise is, in many respects, a consciousness-raising exercise, it stands to reason that Walker's non-fictional work can and does augment the corpus of material that addresses contemporary issues. For example, speaking to the Black Students Association at Sarah Lawrence College in February 1970, Walker stressed the importance of, again, of this notion of knowing how to read. Her examples point to the nuances of illiteracy that often merit little attention. In highlighting that correct phonetic pronunciation, 
and perfected oratorical skills are not necessarily indicative of our ability to comprehend the written word, Walker posits correctly, in my opinion, that an inability to translate the articulation of someone else's presentation of reality, irrespective of the genre employed, becomes little more than a meaningless verbal exercise. Her analysis raises several questions. For example, how do we learn to read? And this is a question we cannot emphasize enough. What motivates us to be intentional and diligent in learning? Why is it imperative to know how to read a perspective that is different than the one, than the one that one holds dear? Walker's review of Florence Ingle Randall's The Almost Year is a summary class analysis. In particular, it illustrates the despair that is a lived rea reality for many who are consigned to inhabit the United States ghettos while also those who are in a position to affect radical change are often unable or unwilling to grasp the magnitude of the problem. As a result, glimpses of an alternative lifestyle become yet another ploy to assuage the feelings of well-intentioned individuals while internalized rage brews within one who dies a slow and maybe even pain-filled death. From the high-rise high rat-infested tenements, to the upper echelons of corporate America, to the halls of academia, Walker reminds us, and I quote, that black misery and rage are not yet the stuff of fairy tale conclusions, close quote. Yet from black misery and rage, gifts of genius in diverse literary forms have given voice not to fairy tale conclusions, but have instead provided examples of coping, surviving, living, and thriving that serve as models for directing anger and claiming one's agency. Allison P. Geis Johnson, an alumna, a graduate of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology and a former faculty member, in her sto call story titled Tensions, Tears, and Triumphs, reminds us of the importance of sharing interpretations of the past for the sake of forging a powerfully faithful future. In this reflective narrative, included in This Is My Story, Testimonies and Sermons of Black Women in Ministry, edited by Cleophas J. LaRue, Geis Johnson, quoting Cannon, emphasizes that we should always be conscious of the systemic evil that surrounds us without allowing it to paralyze us. For the work of justice requires wholeness of body, wholeness of mind, and wholeness of spirit. In a March 13, 2019 essay, Black Women's Wisdom, Womanist Theology and How It Has Evolved, published in the Christian Century, Ebony Marshall Terman, Associate Professor of Theology and African American Religion at Yale Divinity School, traces the trajectory of womanist religious thought. She writes that Canon, and I quote, together with four other black women inquirers, advanced the fundaments of a new form of discourse and emerged as a matriarch of theological womanism, a theology that affirms the significance of black women's God talk, survival and flourishing for determining the substance of faithful Christian discourse and praxis, close quote. Marshall Terman points out that, and again, I quote, long before Cannon brought womanist God talk into the realm of academic discussion, it was flourishing in the faithful lives of black Christian women. Womanism was born around black women's kitchen tables, on front porches, in beauty shops, in women's clubs, in varieties of black women's prayer closets, and in various women's spaces within the black church. In these spaces, as black women came to know the love, mercy, and justice of God for themselves, they forced a theology that boldly affirms that black women's lives are significant and valuable, not only to God, but also to the church and the world. In the social, political, and religious realms that so often erased black women's experiences, black women of faith had the courage to believe and assert, I am. I am here, I am fully human, 
I am fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of God, close quote. Marshall Terman offers a description of womanist theology that details the multidimensional contextuality of a theology that, and I quote, grew organically and in many spaces at once. In all of its manifestations, it is deeply grounded in the long, fecund history of black women's traditions of survival and flourishing, rituals of celebration, and resistance to white racism and patriarchy. Black women's hope and courage in resisting race, gender, and class-based oppression stems from their rootedness in faith, a faith in God that has been passed down through generations of women of African descent throughout the diaspora, close quote. Using Walker's four-part definition, again, that's found in Search of Our Mother's Gardens, Womanist Prose, as an interpretive framework, Marshall Terman is clear that, and I quote, at the heart of this faith is love, an unapologetic self-love in a world that has historically despised black women. Love for the spirit and a deep love of creation, culture, joy, and laughter. Womanist theology loves out loud, and it loves widely. Womanism is deeply concerned about the well-being of the entire community, woman and man. In a womanist garden, every person matters. Womanist theology is aimed at supporting all oppressed communities in the work of liberation, while affirming black women's capacities wisdom and independence, close quote. For as Walker asserts in her essay, recording the seasons, and I quote, there is a reality deeper than what we see, and the consciousness of a people cannot be photographed, but to some extent, it can be written, close quote. Thus, the ability to see beyond the obvious requires both the skill to go deep by raising a series of seemingly unended questions, coupled with a willingness to address, to address the tension that emerges from a critical encounter with life's paradoxical and complex issues. It could be said that the realization that there is a reality deeper than what we see can be credited to an emerging awareness that proficiency in reading invisible transcripts is an invaluable resource in analyzing any situation. Yet many of the resources to which we assign some type of authoritative rele relevance assume persons have access to engaging the works of individuals who have been classified as leading thinkers in a respective tradition. This perspective implies that not only are theoretical constructs the private domain of a selected self-appointed group, it also suggests that knowledge is determined, is determined based on a preconceived idea. Therefore, the Cartesian model, I think, therefore I am, becomes the accepted standard against which other representations of logic are measured. Walker, on the other hand, demands that we challenge this position. She insists that we consider the significance of experiential knowledge Indeed, following this line of thought, we must seek to clarify who is capable of thought and subsequently perceived as complete as whole human beings. Womanist scholars stress the importance of developing an appreciation for the value contained within lived experiences, while at the same time emphasizing the significance of intentionally engaging in a critical examination of oral histories and non-scribal artifacts. When interpreting retrieved insights from the complexity ascribed to living a life unaware, the courage to tell the story of a collective existence emerges from women who, and I quote, gather together to assure understanding among black women so that understanding among women, close quote, because becomes a catalyst to live so that others might also live. For example, Walker states in her essay, again, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, is a personal account that is yet shared in its theme and in its meaning by all of us. She asserts that she, and I quote, found while thinking about the far-reaching world of the creative black woman, 
that often the truest answer to a question that really matters can be found very close, 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 close quote. In a 1974 letter to Ms. Magazine, Walker discusses her experience as a first time attendee at the National Black Feminist Organization Conference. In this concise editorial, Walker provides example that almost 50 years later, continue to demand the attention of anyone who is concerned about the treatment of any people who have been conditioned to deny their sense of personhood. But suffice it to say that Walker does more than allude to issues related to fear, paralysis, solidarity, self-awareness, and revolution. In her correspondence to Ms. Magazine, Walker identifies a solution, purpose every day, she says, to save the life that is your own, a purpose that became Katie Geneva Cannon's mantra. To begin this process, Walker asks, why, asks any who are committed to survival and wholeness of entire people to consider, and I quote, how simple a thing it seems to her that to know ourselves as we are, we must know our mother's names. Yet we do not know them. Or if we do, it is only the names we know and not the lives, close quote. And let me clarify here to suggest that Walker also understands the, the difference between mothering, understood as in a narrow um, sense as one who gives physical birth, from mothering as a concept of nature and nurture that may or may not come from one who gives physical birth. This observation is supported in part by the non-assignment of materials that attest to black women's struggles as primary sources on syllabi across a range of academic studies. For as Walker implies, a survey might reveal, and I quote, when we look back over our history, it is clear that we have neglected to save just those people who could help us most, close quote. Although several scholars suggest that personal encounters are the basis from which moral actions can be analyzed, their arguments too quickly shift from the particular to explanations of universal application. This tendency to introduce and then dismiss the significance of specificity points to a desire to deflect that is not indicative of reality. Walker, on the other hand, encourages self-naming, this act of agency, the ability to self-name in spite of historical experiences allows us to affect change through the telling of our stories, which contributes to the expanding of our canon. Thus, mastery of language is crucial in naming our experience. According to Walker, and I quote, it is language more than anything else that reveals and validates one's existence. And if the language we actually speak is denied us, then it is inevitable that the form we are permitted to assume historically will be one of caricature, reflecting someone else's literary or social fantasy. For the language is an intrinsic part of who we are and what has, for good or evil, happened to us. And amazingly, it has sustained us more securely than the arm of angels." Close quote. In dusting off the sources, Walker recognizes that reclaiming ancestral sounds is an essential aspect of her work. In other words, and I quote, it is not by suppressing our own language that we counter other people's racist stereotypes of us, but by having the conviction that if we present the words in the context that is or was natural to them, we do not perpetuate stereotypes, but rather expose them. And more important, we help the ancestors in ourselves and others continue to exist. If we kill off the sound of our ancestors, the major portion of us, all that is past, that is history, that is human, is lost. And we become historically and spiritually thin, a mere shadow of who we were on the earth." Close quote. Thus, there is an interconnectivity in Walker's work that fosters an interweaving of time past, present, and future that challenges us to, and I quote, understand we are who we are largely because of who we have been. And who we have been 
has come down to us as the vibration of souls we can know only through the sound and structure, the idiosyncrasies of speech." Close quote. It is then, through a renewed appreciation of lived experiences, that we discover clues that facilitate the naming process. As an act of self-naming, Walker encourages us to reclaim our narratives. She writes, and I quote, that it is because the language of our memories is suppressed that we tend to see our struggle to retain and respect our memories as unique. And of course, our language is suppressed because it reveals our cultures. Cultures at variance with what the dominant white, well-to-do culture perceives itself to be. To permit our language to be heard, and especially the words and speech of our old ones, is to expose the depths of the conflict between us and our oppressors and the century it has not at all silently raged. While the term intersectionality, which emerged from the ideas debated in critical race theory, may not be included in Sunday or church school literature, we can use Walker's non-fictional works to examine how intersectionality, a concept that impacts many people in ways that unfortunately routinely escalates injustice and inequality in everyday lives. Coined more than 30 years ago by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, a professor of law at Columbia University and the University of California at Los Angeles, to describe the unique way black women experience the law, intersectionality refers to the notion that a person's identity is often shaped by multiple constructs, race, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and so forth, yet rarely does life or the law account for the complexities of these overlapping experiences. Black women, Crenshaw argues, and I quote, often experience intersecting patterns of racism and sexism in ways that cannot be wholly captured by looking at race and gender separately, close quote. Yet even now in the shadow of Southern Baptist Seminary President's, president's 2020 claims that critical race theory is incompatible with Christianity, Crenshaw aptly notes, and I quote, that our legal regime, along with our anti-racist and feminist discourse, seems incompatible of recognizing how multiple forms of discrimination can combine to impact people. For the marginalizing persons already on the margins, close quote, and in some cases, pushed over artificially constructed boundaries. Jason A. Gilmer, the Hemmingson Chair in Civil Liberties and Professor of Law at Gonzaga University School of Law and Director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, acknowledges, and I quote, Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality has only grown in salience since she first gave it a name. People are, he says, and I quote, coming to understand more and more that invisible intersections often compound bias and discrimination, close quote. He further notes that Crenshaw is clear intersectionality is, and I quote, not just about black women. Sexual orientation, class, religion, immigration status, disability, in addition to race and gender, all shape individual experience, close quote. For Crenshaw, it is, and again I quote, important that we use intersectionality theory to see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects, close quote. When we, as Crenshaw asserts, and I quote her, shine a light onto these intersections, we can better address instances of injustice and inequality for tr traditionally marginalized and underrepresented people, close quote. Following this line of thinking, Walker's treatment of issues highlights the importance of searching for meaning in historical treasures. Since truth, at least from my perspective, is always subjective, this quest may contribute to a greater appreciation for specificity that in turn may foster more intentionality in questioning general assumptions. For example, Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens points to the importance of having dialogical partners whose primary canons and belief systems may be in direct and unequivocal opposition to the dominant position, but that nevertheless contribute in significant ways to articulating an apologetic. In using Walker's non-fictional work as a lens by which to engage in intersectional analysis, we're encouraged to search for and to dust off discarded sources so that future generations might benefit from the wisdom contained therein. But we do not engage sources authored or otherwise generated by women out of a sense of obligation, nor, we do, nor do we seek to romanticize pain-filled experiences. Rather, we engage in conversations to become more intimately acquainted with self. 
from black women religious scholars who love themselves completely, even in and perhaps especially during those moments when self-love and self-affirmation surface as internal external struggles, we are recipients of candid discussions about God that invite us to engage in a deliberate examination of practices, theories, behaviors that give meaning to who we are and whom we are yet becoming. With flesh that cloaks competence, compassion, brilliance, beauty, forthrightness, and fortitude, womanist religious scholars encourage us to consider the ways in which our very embodiment is an act of resilient resistance as we navigate spaces and places that are sometimes simultaneously home and alien. I am a product of the church, and more specifically, a daughter of the black church. As a social ethicist who self-identifies as a follower of the Christ and a womanist, I am encouraged by a convocation focus on the relevancy of preaching in a capitalistic, globalized economy that is often indistinguishable from practices in places and spaces known by some as church. At the same time, Lincoln and Mamaya's sociological study of seven historical black denominations, and just let me say, this is, the, this is still the only sustained sociological examination of black church. It is time for somebody else to do some more work and to expand and to call into question some of the assumptions and conclusions that Lincoln and Mamaya draw in their work, which is still a gift to the black church, a gift to the academy, and a gift to the world. As I ponder the relevancy of the black church, in a country whose project in democracy, established on a lie and fraught with ambiguity, I was drawn to Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, and I invite you, invite you to hear these words. And then I might have some questions for you. On that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, in order that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this. The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps, and the treader of grapes the one who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall, plant, they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Convocation 2022's theme and this pericope Call into, questions, associ call into question associated personal and communal implications as we consider the relevancy of the black church. After all, the restoration of one's soul, the restoration of one's very being in occupied territory is an embodied act of justice that demands a commitment to truth and action. It is a commitment born out of an understanding of the nature, purpose, and function of the black church, as well as an understanding of society that is reflective of one's relationship with God. Consider the following questions. If, to borrow from the late Reverend Wallace Hartsville Sr., a silent church is a complicit church, why is it imperative for the church to engage in social justice? And let me say, I'm thankful for Dr. Mary Young last night and Pastor Cedric this morning, who named some moral issues with which the black church needs to wrestle. What might we glean from the concluding verses of a prophet from the town of Tekoa in the hills of the southern kingdom, Judah, 
who delivered his message of doom to the northern kingdom Israel during the reigns of Uzziah and Jeroboam II. To what might we attribute his strong solidarity with the poor of the land? Since it is difficult to determine Amos's socioeconomic status, what risk might he have assumed when he spoke honestly and candidly about the evils within Israel and prophesied the destruction God would bring as judgment? Amos clearly saw the present suffering of the economically and legally exploited masses, the present luxury of the wealthy and comfortable few, as well as the future suffering of those wealthy when God's day of wrath would bring war and exile. This exploitation, which Amos described very graphically, chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, chapter 5, verses 11 through 12, and chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, had reached such proportions that justice and righteousness were utterly perverted. Religion had become a comfortable ritual, divorced from God's demands for justice, and monarchy and priesthood were corrupt. Knowing of God's relationship with Israel, if Amos's message has contemporary relevance, what divine warnings is being offered to the black church and what are we ignoring today? Given expanded awareness and knowledge of race, gender, and class disparities, how might a more nuanced reading of Amos inform our response to women and children who are impoverished and subjected to a level of victimization that often translates into forms of invisibility and dehumanization? Amos expressed as clearly as any Hebrew prophet God's demand for justice, God's disgust with worship that ignored economic realities, and God's love and concern for those who were exploited. Amos demonstrated a clear understanding as well of many of the forces that prevented justice in Israel. Greed, desire for opulence and idleness, a false sense of security, reliance on placating God with offerings, dishonesty in business dealings, and corruption of the legal system. The problem in Israel was not that the people did not know intellectually the precepts of the law and their concern for the needy. The problem was the unwillingness on the part of the leaders and judges to administer the law fairly. This is what led to the disregard for justice. And what was worse, all this happened in the midst of thriving religiosity. People flocked to the shrines that, but disregarded God's call for God's people to do justice to the needy. Amos's message essentially asserts that religion made things worse for Israel. And let me do a pause here and say, though I am a womanist, Christian ethicist, I lean more towards agreeing with historian of religion's definition of religion than I do with those of, that, that, than I do with the one that's typically offered by a number of my brothers and sisters who are theologians. Historians of religion say that religion is ultimately one's world view. And one can have a world view without having faith in God. One can have a world view professed to be Christian, but yet that view is antithetical to the one who came that we might have life and have that life completeness. Amen. Ritualistic faithfulness will often mask ethical unfaithfulness. Amen. As a reminder, Amos wrote, during the relatively long and peaceful reigns of Uzziah and Jeroboam II in approximately 760 before the Common Era, yet Amos was persistent in his announcement to the people of Israel that because of their social injustice and religious arrogance, the Lord will punish them by means of a total military disaster. While his words are startling and dramatic, Amos's message was a direct appeal to traditions that he and his hearers held in common. Among these is the belief that the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt and granted the people the land of Canaan. 
Amos also takes it for granted that the people of Israel had always known what the, that the Lord expected of them, justice and righteousness. As such, Amos is, not, Amos is not introducing any new moral or legal expectations, but simply holding the people accountable for their transgressions. If Amos's message was direct and uncompromising, what does the Lord require of the black church as we survey the United States' current political, social, re religious landscape, what is our response to a resurgence, this is, not, this is not new, to a resurgence of white Christian nationalism? Amos understands justice to be tied up inextricably with life. Do justice and live, Amos asserts. Do injustice and die. An unjust society will die. It cannot help but collapse of its own weight. And again, let me do a little pivot here. Any society established upon a lie will eventually self-destruct. A question for us in this nation becomes not will empire fail, because history tells us that, that eventually all empires fail. The question becomes, what will emerge? Will folk be so held to their understanding of what the past was in an idyllic sense that they cannot exercise the imagination to birth something afresh? The goal of justice must always be life. As one scholar aptly notes, and I quote, justice seeks life for everyone in the community, close quote. Because life is for everyone, justice pays particular attention to the people being denied life. Who's being denied life in the context in which we participate? Justice provides for access by all to the communal good life. None can justly prosper at the expense of others or even in the light of the poverty and need of others. Hence, Amos sees justice as part of the created order. It is unnatural to be unjust. To be unjust is thus inherently self-destructive. Injustice is the poison that poisons its practitioners. Amen. To concur with me is to affirm why the black pulpit should be the epitome of the proclamation of good news premised on equity, access, participation, and rights. To realize the hope-filled vision Amos articulates in the last verses of his prophecy, the black church is called to speak truth to power and to be doers of justice on behalf of persons who often live daily with their backs pressed against the wall, unable to think about thriving because they are struggling to think about making it from one minute to the next. However, if we are honest with self and with each other, we must acknowledge that the black church's engagement in social justice is both an internal and external process of reflection and action. We must be committed to dismantling systems of oppression both within the black church and in the broader society. For some of us, this will require a long and hard look at patriarchal and misogynistic structures predicated upon perceived notions of God's sanctioned genitalia privilege. And let me say that sadly, For some of us, this will require a long and hard look at patriarchal and misogynistic structures predicated upon perceived notions of God's sanctioned genitalia privilege. And let me say, as a daughter of the black church, there came a moment in my life when I had to seek forgiveness because I helped to perpetuate these notions. And so when we realize 
that everything that we have received is not necessarily good, that it is not necessarily just, that it is not necessarily right. We need to step back and ask God to show us clearly whom we have harmed and whom, from whom we need to seek forgiveness. We do this work while simultaneously advocating for equal pay for all people. For others, it may necessitate a rethinking of clergy as mandated reporters such that we implement programs staffed with qualified and trained professionals to address sexual misconduct and predatory behaviors while simultaneously advocating against human trafficking, much of which occurs on the I-95 corridor that runs through this city. A few of us may need to examine ways in which our message of welcome does not align with our practice of welcoming strangers into our midst as we work to advance a Christian message of welcoming persons who seek to cross our borders, often because of violence and extreme poverty in their home country that is exacerbated by U.S. policies and operative forms of neocolonialism cloaked in Christian rhetoric. Amen. Perhaps for such a time as now, it appears that the evils Amos described are unfolding in real time with unimaginable global implications. We need to be reminded of a rich heritage that points to ways in which the black church has engaged in social justice in this occupied, blood-soaked, tears-of-trail land we call home. From hush harbors during the period of chattel slavery that gave voice to a god of faith that was antithetical to slave-holding religion. Beloved, we need to be clear to name the God upon whom we call. Because I don't know about y'all, but I know that the God that I worship is not the God that's worshiped by some other folk. Amen. Amen. To underground railroad conductors who transform familiar songs into code on behalf of persons who understood that freedom was not a concept reserved strictly for heaven, for the by and by. To the emergence of historical black churches that refuted notions of racially based segregation in worship predicated upon a distorted theology of humanity. To the black women's club movement forged in faith and committed early to the wholeness of all people to anti-lynching advocates who documented human atrocities and called into question economics of racism and a myth of white womanhood. To the many women and men from across this nation who placed their lives on the line during the 1960s civil rights movement so that all citizens might participate fully in all areas of our collective life, most notably the right to vote. To architects of the Black Lives Matter movement who brought to the forefront police atrocities and an ongoing denial by one too many that political respectability can save us. So when we survey human and civil rights in the communities in which we reside and work, what does the God of our faith require of us? In other words, what is at risk if the black church does not repent of our sexism homophobia, transphobia, youth, youth shaming, desegregationist assimilation proclivities. What's at risk if we don't divest ourselves of that? I recognize that for some, this could mean acknowledging ways the black church's sense of being may demand a more critical engagement and interrogation of sacred texts given that interpretations, which are always biased, do affect the lives of humans and the communities in which we live. Thus, a call to action in response to any moral problem is an invitation to the black church to engage in an intersectional process of intense self-reflection. But issues of race must always be held in tension with social dynamics and realities such as gender, identity, orientation, age, class, ability. In some regards, this process may best be described as an act of accountability 
by which the black church acknowledges and seeks forgiveness for our own participation in practice built upon and sustained by unquestioned constructions of whiteness and patriarchy as normative. And let me say, I have some brothers who are more non-patriarchal than I have sisters who populate and see themselves as gatekeepers of a church tradition. We have got to do better. In so doing, when we divest ourselves of these things, the black church can model the prophetic mandate to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with the divine through embodied expressions that signal to others that justice demands that we name things as they are and not as we imagine or wish they were. One week on this side of the 2022 midterms, we have only to look at the extent to which persons across this country embrace the lie that the 2020 national elections were fraudulent, to recognize that there is ongoing demand for the implementation of human and civil rights in this country. It is a demand that particularly calls into question the inability of one too many persons who self-identify as Christian to recognize the full humanity of all people. This humane acknowledgement is one that also challenges all of us in general, and the black church in particular, to note the ways in which a misappropriation of doctrine and theology functions to negate ways in which persons not only stand them, understand themselves, but often seeks to restrict their ability, our ability, to divest of ambiguity around traditions that are life negating. At the same time, allow me to suggest that the black church must also question a tendency to embrace suffering as a virtue. Amen. In other words, the black church must be attentive to a theology of suffering, redemptive or otherwise construed, that must take into account the art of rhetoric as transmitted and translated through black male preachers, patriarchal hierarchy adopted unquestionably as a mode of class and gender dominance, and liberation theologies that may contradict traditionally accepted biblical interpretations. With the emergence of womanist homiletical contributions, by scholarly scholars such as Kimberly Johnson, Lisa L. Thompson, Chelsea Yarborough, and my mentor, who is also one of my pastors, Nelva Sampson, we become recipients of a knowledge that is informed by black church women and the embodiment of a social gospel lived at the intersections of faith, activism, advocacy, and protest. When, men, when women are moved from margins of invisibility and sent visibly within a tradition, we may find ourselves surprised by their response to why preaching matters. Thank you.